I'm wondering, Tom, if we could next talk a bit about preaching. And um, it strikes me that your last comment is a powerful lead into it, that the connection between preaching and imagination is so, so powerful. And the way in which uh, so many of your sermons are really about that, inviting us to imagine, uh, to construe the world in an entirely different way. There, it's almost like it's a worldview therapy. Uh, that's maybe too 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 uh, cheeky a term for it, but it, it's meant to say it's it's not um, anything less than that. And um, and I, I wonder if we could if I could ask you a bit about you know we we use a term preach sermon on a on a routine basis, but these two these terms come to mean quite different things in different traditions. And uh, how might we resuscitate the the deep biblical um, invitation uh, into yes. practices of proclamation. Yes, yes. Well, proclamation is an interesting word um, and, and a very important word, although that can sometimes itself be taken over by people who want to say, I mean, there's been some movement in this direction in some rather conservative parts of the Church of England that, that, that all ministry is basically proclamation, that we just have to declare what the truth is and God will apply it to people's lives and we don't really need to do anything else. I mean, I'm caricaturing, but, but that, that's a danger in some circles. However, I want to recover uh, a fully biblical note of proclamation. It's always been frustrating to me writing about Jesus in his historical context, that many people talk about the preaching of Jesus and the people who write thus and who read that sort of thing will often think of preaching as, well, on a Sunday morning, the, the person in, in charge gets up in a pulpit and talks for 10 minutes or 20 minutes, whatever it is, and gives us a few lessons to think about. And then they imagine that that's what Jesus was doing, just giving them a few lessons to think about, ways to help them through the, well, and of course, Jesus' message contained things that would help them through the next days and weeks, but it was a proclamation, it was an announcement, it was saying dramatically, God is right now becoming king, and this is what it looks like, rather than what you imagined. And so the announcement of something that people expect, but the subversion of the expectations and their replace, replacement with a different imagined vision, of course, much of Jesus' teaching, if you want to call it teaching, which is subject to the same problems there, is, is in the form of parables, which are, as you rightly hinted, ways of breaking open worldviews and redirecting and reorienting them um, so that, uh, you know, the prophets had spoken about God coming after the exile to sow Israel like a field again, and that now there would be new plants coming up. Think of the end of Isaiah 55 or the passages in Jeremiah like this. And Jesus, with his first great parable and set of parables in Mark 4, Matthew 13, is, is saying, yes, God is indeed sowing Israel again, but watch out because some is falling among thorns, some is going to the stones, some birds of the air take, and there will be some that bears fruit 30 fold, 60 fold and 100 fold, but there'll be an awful lot that won't. Um, and you can just think, help, what does this mean? How, how does this work? Um, so it seems to me, if we are to take seriously Jesus' proclamation, then preaching the word, which is a phrase which um, was used about Jesus, he was announcing the word and the Acts of the Apostles, the Apostles went about preaching the word, that doesn't simply mean they were expounding scripture. In fact, it specifically usually doesn't mean they were expounding. I mean, scriptural exposition will be part of it, but the word is the news, the message, and news is not simply advice. It's, um, I've often said, you know, there's all the difference in the world between good news and good advice, and good news is saying something has happened as a result of which the world is a different place. Something is going to happen, which we'd all better be prepared for, and we are poised uneasily between the thing which has happened and the thing which will happen. And I, I long for the day when preachers will realize that whatever passage of scripture they're expounding, that message is something that has to be said again and again, because we all too easily slide back and imagine that Christianity is just a religion, a way of being spiritual or something, rather than the constant reminder that something happened in the first third of the first century as a result of which the world is a different place, and as a result of which there is new creation coming down the track. Um, but we are not just to be passive spectators and beneficiaries, we are actually to be agents, we're to be caught up in that. And that's ideally what preaching the word, 
ought to be aiming at, of course, in a thousand different ways, but that's the structure of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, part of the challenge uh, has to do with um, the, the way we use scripture in worship, the way scripture passages are chosen. Uh, that too then is part of uh, the dynamic you're describing uh, about the relationship of preaching to particular texts and the like. And I know in the audience here, we have many people that, um, uh, that use a, a, a lectionary as a disciplined way of uh, approaching scripture and others that, uh, that very much don't. And where the uh, you know, sermons are shaped either perhaps using your Galatians commentary in, in some <laughs> cases for the next several weeks. Um, and those two different worlds of scriptural use are, are two very different worlds against which what you just said will be will be heard. And I wonder yeah. if you could reflect a little bit on that. Uh, the, um, those who are lectionary preachers and have multiple texts that they're working with versus the, the, those preachers that are actively selecting uh, uh, their own text, ideally in a balanced and disciplined way over well, time. I have lived in and worked with churches in both those traditions and some that do one sometimes and the other other times. Um, I have tended to favor uh, the, the lectionary system because it's a way of, uh, it's, if I can put it like this, of, of keeping yourself honest, um, that if you don't have the lectionary in some shape or form, the temptation is to go for favorite passages. Now, there's a good reason why favorite passages are favorite passages. They have spoken to us. We want to share that with other people. Fine. But again and again, uh, it's the whole sweep of scripture we need. I was privileged um, two years, three years ago, I guess it was, um, must have been 2019, to take part in some events in New York City um, through the Grace and Mercy Foundation, who do an extraordinary business of, of large scale scripture reading in public. Um, uh, when I say large scale, they would have, uh, I spoke at a meeting where I think it was about an hour and a half, and they had four or five passages of scripture. When I say passages, I mean three or four chapters at a time, like Matthew 20, um, 23, 24, 25, or, or uh, Romans 5 to 8 or whatever, so that you would get uh, a little three or four minute introduction, that was the bit I did, and then and they had these taped with uh, professional actors reading them brilliantly, and yeah. we listened to this whole sweep of scripture. And I realized that so many churches that I know, you get a rather perfunctory reading of scripture. Somebody stands up and says, we're gonna have the reading from, blah, 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 blah. and then they sit down, and then somebody talks for 20 minutes about something vaguely related, or right. maybe not even vaguely related. I thought, supposing we did it the other way around, <laughs> wouldn't that be wonderful? The, the short like program note, and then now just listen, this is what it's about. Now, of course, most churches couldn't do that most Sundays, but I suspect some churches could and should do that sort of thing, maybe as an evening service, once a month or something, to give people a sense of the scope and the scale and, and the power of the connections of scripture, that it's not just 10 verses on this and 15 verses on that, uh, as though they were just little snippets. That's not how the Bible was written. It's not how it's meant to be read. So that, that's, a, that's a plea to think outside the box in terms of how we do scripture within public worship. But I would say as well, and I, I expect I've, you've heard me say this before, um, that when we, in my tradition at least, read a passage from the Old Testament and a passage from the New within an act of worship, characteristically morning or evening prayer or the Eucharist, what's actually happening is we are praising God for the whole scriptural story. Having those two readings is really important because it reminds us this is not a detached piece of teaching. It is part of a narrative. And that little passage we read from the Old Testament is like a small window. And when we put our eye up to it, we are supposed to have in mind and in our sight the whole of Genesis to Malachi. And then we take a little New Testament passage and that we're supposed to glimpse through the lens of that, the whole of the New Testament, because the reading of scripture is actually about praise. It's, it's not to inform us, it will inform us, but the main purpose is to praise God for his mighty acts, which are displayed in scripture. And within that context, um, then the sermon can go where it goes. But once the context has been set, 
And particularly if you're singing the Psalms as well, which you should be, then the congregation is being held again within this amazing story, which we all too easily forget in the rest of the week. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>